people cried, Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. Uh, today is Palm Sunday for Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Uh, today we celebrate him coming in. And it's the only time really in his ministry that he ascribed to who he was, the Son of God, uh, the King of Israel. Usually he shied away from that sort of thing. Uh, but this is also that time of year that was lamb selection time when the families would choose their lamb and Jesus was coming as the lamb of God that would come to take away the sins of the world and so that's what this day is all about and we're going to read the story here in the book of John uh, it's recorded in all the gospels but I want to read the one in the book of John because it's the only one that mentions uh, the palm trees or the palm branches and that's why we call it Palm Sunday. The other Gospels mention that they laid things in the way, uh, garments and tree branches in the way as Jesus entered in, into Jerusalem. They all mention it, but John's the only one that mentions the palm trees. And uh, the significance of this event uh, to the Jerusalem, to the Israelites, excuse me, uh, was that, uh, you know, and of course they were under Roman oppression, Roman rule, and the Romans had uh, their custom of a triumphal entry after a defeat, after a victory in war. They would have their processional uh, that would come into a town, and it was a grand processional. And that's what uh, the Jews were trying to, to, to imitate or emulate, if you will. And uh, this was, many were hoping for their king, Jesus, to be their king. Uh, but they were looking for an earthly king, obviously. And Jesus wasn't coming at this time to usher in an earthly kingdom, uh, but rather a spiritual kingdom. And so uh, there will come a day when Jesus is coming back, and he will. Uh, defeat Satan and sin and all of that and establish you know, a new heaven, a new earth. And we look forward to that day. You know, we truly do, but that's not the point of what this was all about. But that's why this uh, triumphal entry, uh, they were trying to emulate that which the Romans did. And uh, certainly the, the Romans took notice. And this was a very uh, tense week, if you will, leading up to Easter Sunday uh, in Jerusalem. And so that's why these events took place. And so that's what today is. And so we're going to read this story here in the Gospel of John. Uh, but in the other Gospels, Jesus makes another comment. And that's what I want to focus on today. You'll see from the title of the message uh, that I've entitled this message today, uh, House of Prayer. Um, and that's the message that Jesus gave. Okay, and So that's what we want to focus on this morning. But I do want to start with uh, here in the Gospel of John, uh, why we call it Palm Sunday and and just that story leading up to Jesus entering into the temple as, it, as he triumphantly marches into, this, into the city and he goes right to the temple and he goes into the temple. And, uh, and as soon as he enters the temple, that's when he overthrows the, the money changers' tables. And that's when he says that phrase. And so we'll look at that here this morning. So let's go ahead and read here in the Gospel of John. And uh, we'll look at that just a little bit. Uh, Palm Sunday or his triumphal entry. And we'll see that it's actually prophesied in Old Testament. Uh, just about everything that Jesus did was prophesied in Old Testament and, and then fulfilled in our New Testament. And uh, to me, that's always been a blessing to my heart as we can see all those prophecies about Messiah and how Jesus fulfilled every one of them. Uh, he came to fulfill the scriptures, uh, certainly not to do away with, but to fulfill those scriptures. And so we'll see uh, a couple of those actually today in our, in our message this morning, uh, Jesus fulfilling uh, prophecies. Old Testament scriptures. And so let's go ahead and read here. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 12. Uh, John chapter 12, I'm reading verses 12 through 19 this morning, verses 12 through 19. So uh, open your Bibles there and you can read along with me. But it says, On the next day, uh, much people that were come to the feast, uh, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, uh, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna. Blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh sitting on a donkey's colt. Uh, these things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. And it says, For this cause the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. And the Pharisees therefore said amongst themselves, and I love this verse, I truly do, it's one of my favorite verses in Scripture. The Pharisees uh, therefore said amongst themselves, he says, Perceive how you prevail nothing. Behold, the world is gone after him. <laughs> and it's the truth. 
uh, people have tried have tried to oppress oppress Christianity and God for generations, and they've never succeeded. <laughs> they've always failed. Uh, the world has never prevailed against the Lord, and they never will. Uh, in case you haven't read to the end of the book, <laughs> uh, Jesus Christ is the victory. Uh, we like to sing that hymn, you know, that he is the victory, and we have that victory in him. But I love that. The, the Pharisees knew that no matter what they did, no matter what they tried, they could not defeat this Jesus of Nazareth. He truly was a great one. Uh, and they had no idea at the time who he was and how great he was. Uh, but on this day, we see the celebration of that, that triumphal entry. And as I said, this is the only scripture that mentioned they took branches of palm trees. And that's why we call it uh, Palm Sunday. And that's where the, the meaning comes from and that significance to that, those palm branches. Uh, and there's, we could go into a message, and I have before, about the wave sheaf offering in the Old Testament and such. But that's not what I want to look at today. I want to look over in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, after Jesus' triumphal entry, as I said, the next thing he does is he marches to the temple. Okay? Oh, I forgot. I almost forgot. I told you that this is fulfillment. And he actually mentions this here uh, in verse 15. And verse 15, if you have center column references in your Bible, probably gives you a reference to Zechariah 9.9, and that's where this scripture that this, of this triumphal entry, this prophecy of the triumphal entry, is, is found in our Bibles. And so in Zechariah 9.9, let me read that to you. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Uh, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon a donkey and upon a colt, the foal of a donkey. Okay? And so there we see that prophecy in Zechariah that this day would happen. And Jesus knew this day. And it's a part of why he allowed it. Because, again, it's a kind of against his character to, to emulate or lift himself up. That's just not who he was. It's never what he did. He usually shied away from that sort of thing. Uh, but this is fulfillment of prophecy, fulfillment of Scripture. And Jesus did fulfill that. Okay, And so uh, for those of you that follow me, you follow me, you know that I am a King James guy. And you'll know that I did change a word there. And so I used the word donkey just to be a little more family friendly. So just know that I'm not reading from another scripture. I'm still reading King James, but I just used the word donkey, okay? So I just thought I'd throw that in there. So, but anyway, so we see that triumphal entry was prophesied in the Old Testament. We see that it's fulfilled. And John actually makes reference to that prophecy in uh, his writing as he writes about Jesus's triumphal entry, okay? And so then getting back to our, what I was saying, um, then Jesus, after this, he goes up to the temple and he marches into the temple. And uh, this is what he does when he gets there, as he comes into the temple. And, uh, and, and this is found in, in Matthew chapter 21, Matthew chapter 21. And so after, you know, the people allow Jesus to come in, verse 12, Jesus says he went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And he said unto them, It is written, My house, <clears throat> excuse me, my house uh, shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of he thieves. And so that's what I want to focus on today is that message that Jesus had on Palm Sunday, on this triumphal day, triumphal entry day. That message that he has as he allowed this procession and he went, went directly into the temple and he overthrew the tables of those money changers. And he gave them, again, that quote. He says, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And so, uh, again, this is fulfilled, a fulfillment of prophecy, a fulfillment of Old Testament scripture. But let, before I read that, let me just, you know, for those that maybe don't understand what was taking place, you know, this was the great feast, the Passover feast. And Jewish males, of course, were required to come to Jerusalem to the temple to, to, to make an offering. Uh, for an atonement, for a covering of the sins of their family for the next year. And it became easier for them to just come and bring money and to purchase whatever they needed at the temple. And for profit, of course, there was those that were making profit off of this. And so they basically they were making worship easy, you know, and we kind of like that. You know, we like worship to be made easy. And instead of actually raising your own lamb uh, and taking the best lamb that you had, a, a male of the first year without spot or blemish, it was easier just to bring money and to purchase one instead of raising that yourself and bringing it with you to Jerusalem. And so they'd kind of lost the meaning, uh, the purpose of all of this. You know, this was supposed to be a sacrifice on their part, and they were making no sacrifice whatsoever, and how sad that is. And it's something that holds true to this day. You know, he talks about how you've made my house a den of thieves and of robbers. You know, and I, I 
I kind of see that in a lot of our churches today. We've lost the meaning of what church and what worship should all be about. It's, and so it's kind of sad. It's, you know, the convenience that we have are nice, don't get me wrong, but, you know, let's remember that uh, this should be a little bit about sacrifice. We'll talk about that later here, uh, a little bit later in our message, okay? But that message that he gave, he says that my house shall be called the house of prayer. And again, that's prophesied in the Old Testament. And I won't read the whole verse, but in, in Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7, again, we see those words. He says, for mine house shall be called the house of prayer for all people. And he goes on to talk about that den of robbers in that same passage of scripture, okay? Actually mentions that in Jer Jer Jeremiah, Jeremiah 7, 11. He says, in this house, which is called by name, become a den of robbers in your eyes. And so... Again, a couple of Old Testament passages that we see mentioned here that Jesus mentions. He knew his Bible. He knew the scriptures, of course. And so he, he, he put them out before the people to get them to understand. And, and it, it is sad that we see that today, that God's house, which should be called a house of prayer, is not, you know, a, a people of prayer. Instead, we've, we've become a people of convenience. And, and how sad that is that we're not willing to be inconvenienced, you know, even for a day to come to church. You know, eventually the social distancing ban will be lifted and uh, we'll be allowed to get out and get about and do things. And hopefully people will make their way back to church. I imagine probably that first Sunday that we're allowed, uh, we'll see a lot of packed houses. And that's good. Uh, and hopefully it'll remain that way. You know, now that we've had something that we've taken for granted, taken away from us, you know, hopefully it'll become important to us again to get into the actual church house and be there to fellowship and to worship God uh, together with our brothers and sisters in the Lord, okay? And so hopefully we will. Hopefully we'll see that return back to the Lord of people getting back to the house of God and being where we should be. But our people, our, us as Christians, this, this should be a house of prayer. <clears throat> and of course, making reference to the Father's house, you know, that patriarchal system that the Jews lived under. You had the Father who was in charge, if you will, of that entire house of providing and taking care of, and the people would bring the resources, and they would share them equally amongst everyone that was a part of that house, and, and in turn receive the care and keeping and protection of the Father. And our God and our Father in heaven, you know, he doesn't require us much of us. Uh, we see in the Old Testament how that Jacob, how he, he gave a tenth of that which the Lord had blessed him with, and we see the beginning of that tithe. Uh, before really even the law, uh, we see that establishment of giving back to God that which he's blessed us with, okay? And so the tithe is not a legalistic thing, but it is a part of it as we give to the Lord and, and then in turn God blesses us and takes care of us and provides for us and provides us that protection that we need. And so, but anyway, this, this house, this father's house, God's house, this family of God uh, that Christians are a part of. If you're saved and know Jesus Christ is your Savior, then you're a part of the Father's house. And he is saying, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Uh, how important that is, especially in this day and age that we live in, to be a people or a house of prayer. You know, it's funny if you look up online and you Google that house of prayer, there's a lot of churches and ministries out there that call themselves the house of prayer. And that's cool. You know, nothing wrong with that. But, um, uh, are we a people of prayer? Are we known as a people of prayer? Uh, when folks have a need, do they call you up? Do they text you and say, hey, can you pray for me or pray for so-and-so? I would hope so. That's what we need to be known for. You know, I'm very thankful when people come to me with their prayer requests. I'm very thankful indeed. And it's accounted as a privilege to be able to counsel and to pray uh, for people in need. And it's good to see when those prayers are answered as well. Uh, but again, our, this house, he said, shall be called a house of prayer. But instead, he says, and as I said in Jeremiah, again, he says, in this house, which is called by my, my name, he says, it has become a den of robbers in your eyes. Behold, he says, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. And so it's sad you know, that we see that the house of God, the family of God, is not what it should be today. And so we need to be known as a house of prayer. And so I got to thinking about that. You know, how can I best picture that? Uh, us being a house of prayer. And the verse that came to my mind, it is a very familiar passage of scripture, and every time I try to quote it, it seems like I mess it up because there are a lot of parts to it. But it's a, a verse that we use a lot of times for revival, uh, revival in America. And it's true. This is where re revival would start. And it's the Second Chronicles seven fourteen. wrote it down so I don't have to quote it to you because I know I'll mess it up. Uh, but Second Chronicles chapter seven seven fourteen says, If my people, which are called by name my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then 
will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. As you can see, a lot of moving parts in that verse, a lot of things. And I want to focus on the four things that he shares that you and I should be doing. You know, if we want to be called the house of prayer, if we want to be known as a people of prayer, uh, four things that he shares with us, and, and one kind of a, a preface to that as well, but four things that he shares that should be a part of, of our life if we are to be known as a people of prayer. And the preface is that he says, if my people which are called by my name. First and foremost, we need to know that we're saved. Okay? Do you know that today? Do you know Jesus Christ is your Savior? God loves you, and Jesus Christ died for you. Okay? And he has told us that if we'll repent, Jesus said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And so he says, if we'll repent, and then by faith, reach out to him, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so anyone who will repent or turn from their sins and then turn to Jesus and ask him to be their Savior, God has promised that he will save your soul. It's a promise from God. It's something that he's given to us. And it's, God will not forget his promises. The Bible says he's not slack concerning his promises. Okay, God is willing that all should be saved. That's what he wants. He desires that. So if my people, which are called by my name, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, you need to get saved today. Right now, the Bible says, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the accepted day. Uh, this is the best time in the world to be saved and know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Uh, even right now, you can pause this video and pray, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I ask that you save my soul. It really is that simple. God has made salvation that easy. He doesn't want people to have to die and go to hell. And so if we place all of our faith and trust in him, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us. He has promised that he will save us and he will seal us by the power of the Holy Spirit of God unto that day of redemption uh, when Jesus Christ returns. If we, either we die first or the Lord returns in the cloud and we go to meet him, uh, we will be sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit until that day of redemption. Say, preacher, are you one of those ones that believe you can't lose your salvation? Absolutely. I do believe in eternal security. I believe that Jesus Christ died one time for our sins. And when we accept Christ as our Savior, he dies. He pays the price for all of our sins. They're all under the blood. My salvation is not based upon me. It's based upon him and his promises that he has given to us in his word. The only thing I bring to this is my sin. <laughs> and I lay it at the, at the altar. I lay it at the feet of Jesus at the foot of the cross. And uh, Jesus has paid that price for my sins once and for all. So, yes, I do believe in eternal security. And so if my people, which are called by my name, <clears throat> do you know you're saved today? That's kind of a preface to all this, to make sure that we know that we're saved. And then he goes on. The first things he says, he talks about us humbling ourselves. And that's what I was talking about when we first started, about the sacrifices that you and I need to make. You know, again, we live in a time of, of great creature comforts, comforts where life is so easy, where life is so simple. And we're seeing a lot of that infringed upon. And some people are not taking too kindly to it. And they're getting mean and nasty about it and such. Uh, they don't truly understand what sacrifice is all about. Sacrifice that took place during, say, uh, World War II or the Great Depression. Times like that when sacrifice had to be made. You know, and we see a lot of great people out there doing a lot of great things right now. And amen to that, okay? Uh, but some folks are just, they're not taking too kindly to that. I don't know where you are in that, uh, but uh, you know, be patient, be, you know, be accepting. But as we read in our scripture, we need to humble ourselves. All of us do, every one of us. I don't care where you are in the grand scheme of things. The Bible says we do need to humble ourselves. That's something that's actually found in scripture quite a bit. As I was looking for some other verses to back up this idea of, of being humble, Jesus, as I said, was a very humble man. You know, this triumphal entry was something that went against his very nature, his very character. Uh, Jesus actually didn't, he, he kind of shied away from that type, type of thing. He showed, uh, certainly he patterned a life of humility, even though he was the very son of God, perfect and sinless in all his ways, and yet he shied away from that. We all can learn a lesson from Jesus, but certainly there's a lot of scriptures that talking about us being humble. The ones that I chose is in the, in the book of James, the epistle of James. Uh, James was the half-brother of Jesus. And it's interesting that after Jesus' resurrection, uh, he went and had a little meeting with his brother. Who knows what all they talked about? Probably a lot of like, you know, when you're the man of the house now, you need to take care of the family. You're the, you know, the guy in charge and stuff. But I believe he imparted a lot of wisdom uh, that others didn't get. And so it's one of the things when you read the, 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 the epistle of James that he wrote, uh, we can understand that that's probably coming right from the Lord himself. How awesome is that? Not that any scripture is more important than the other. They're all important, but it just kind of gives you a little viewpoint, a perspective. And this is what James had to say about uh, being humble. And he says, and I'm going to read verse 6 and then verse 10. 
uh, kind of mash those two together, but he says, God giveth uh, more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth, okay, we understand what that means, resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. And so he goes on in verse 10, he says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. This is contrary to what we're taught in the world today. We're told to, to look out for me, myself, and I, to exalt myself, you know, stand up for yourself. And this is the exact opposite of that, you know, and that's not the way that the world sees things. You think about this for a second, though. If somebody comes at you and they're very proud and boastful and demanding, don't you resist that? But if somebody comes at you meek and mild and, and very understanding, you're more apt to want to help them. Amen? I know I am. You know, that's my human nature. You know, and usually when someone comes at me with pride, my thought is like, I'm not helping you. <laughs> you know, maybe in, in Christian love I should, or maybe sometimes I even do, but I don't want to. And, and it's the same thing with the Lord. When we live a life of humility that was patterned again by Jesus in his life, the way that he lived, uh, then, then God says, listen, he'll give you more grace, the grace that you need to endure uh, the difficult things that you're going through in your life. How, how wonderful is that to know that God is going to give us the grace that we need to help us? And then uh, later on in verse 10, he says, then God will lift you up out of the miry clay, out of the, the, the pit, <laughs> out of the depths of despair, <laughs> whatever, okay? Uh, but God will lift us up, and, and I've experienced that in my own life. And if you're honest, I think you'll admit to it as well that there have been so many times in my life uh, that the Lord has lifted me up and helped me through a very difficult time in my life and given me that grace that I need. And it comes by being humble, by not being demanding of God and of others as well. You know, being humble and, 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 and lowering ourselves a little bit. Uh, pride goeth before destruction. And as the Bible says, I might be par paraphrasing that wrong, but you understand. And so we need to be careful of that pride. So that's the first thing. Step one is that we do need to humble ourselves. And then number two, uh, what we were talking about, the house of praise, is then, then we need to pray. Yeah, well, we could spend a lot of time talking about prayer. As a matter of fact, if you go uh, to Christian bookstores or look in books, Christian bookstores online, there is a lot of books on the subject of prayer. And I've said this before, you know, even Jesus' disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. Uh, prayer is a very important thing that you and I have. Communication with God. Uh, communication with him. And we are encouraged to pray. And so, you know, what verses... Uh, do we use? I again I had a hard time trying to pick. <clears throat> excuse me, just a verse, but I'll share this one with you. Ephesians chapter six, verse eight, verse eighteen. The Bible says, "Praying always." Wow. When should I pray? Always. Wow. Let that sink in for just a second. Praying always. Wow. Praying always with all prayer and supplications in the spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance. And supplication for all saints. Whew. See, we're never off the hook. We should always be a people of prayer. As we were saying, you know, Jesus was saying, my house should be called the house of prayer. Uh, is your church, are you personally known as a person of prayer? That ought to be our first go-to thing. When we get up in the morning, uh, we should be praying to the Lord, thanking him for another night. Whether it was a good night or a bad night, thanking him for another night, another day that he's given us, another opportunity to serve, praying he says, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Are you a person of prayer? We truly need to be that. You know, if we're worried, uh, go to the Lord in prayer. If we have a decision to make, go to the Lord in prayer. Someone you know and love is hurting or whatever, take them to the Lord in prayer, okay? Uh, the coronavirus situation, how much have you taken that to the Lord in prayer? You know, really, honestly, how much? You know, it, it's important. There's not a whole lot that I can do for the coronavirus. I, I'm a rule follower, and they say that we're supposed to stay home, and so I'm, I'm all for that. I've always been an introvert, but, you know, and such. And so we can do, there's things that we can do, but a lot that we can't do. And I'm so very thankful for the doctors and the scientists that are working tirelessly right now to find some sort of a vaccination or a treatment for the coronavirus. And, it, you know, you hear different things, and I don't know how, how far they've come along. And so I even pray for them. Uh, for wisdom, uh, that they'd be able to find an answer to this. And I believe that they will. I believe God will give them the, the wisdom and the answers that we need. And so, you know, there's not really a whole lot, though, that me personally, I can do. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a doctor, you know, but I am a person of prayer. And that's probably what 99.9% .9 of us, that's the best thing that we can do is to pray. You know, if we can do more, then by all means do it. You know, if there's other things that you can do to make a difference, then then do those things. But the best thing, the th best thing, usually, usually or mostly, the only thing we can do is pray, and that's that's more than enough. 
I think sometimes we discount prayer and think like, well, that's just, you know, a trade-off. That's not really important. <laughs> How foolish is that? And that's what Jesus is saying. You know, we look at his life and he was a man of prayer himself early. He would get up a great while before day and he would go and pray, uh, always communing with the Father, you know, to find the answers and the, the, the truths that he need. And so my friends today, as it says, praying always, that's why I use that one, because we're never off the hook to pray. And so we need to humble ourselves. We need to pray the third one. Then he says, is then to seek the Lord, uh, to seek him out, to look for those answers, not just praying, but expecting answers. So many times our prayers are prayers of defeat. It's like, well, Lord, I know you're not going to hear this, or Lord, I know you're not really going to do anything about this, or I know that this is worth you. And it's like, why even bother to pray? You know, our prayer should be prayers of faith, believing, trusting that the Lord is. And so when we pray, then we seek the Lord, look for him, look for the answers, believing that he'll give us the answers, either through scripture, through people, just through circumstances, uh, seeking the Lord out. Isaiah 55, 6 says, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Uh, do you seek the Lord in your daily lives? You know, when we get into our Bibles and, and we read the scriptures and we do our daily devotions, are you looking for the Lord? Are you looking for the answers that need to be there? Are you seeking him out in your daily life? You know, are you seeking the Lord and, and opportunities to, to, to serve him and to, 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 to learn from him in your daily life? Because they're there. I guarantee it. I promise you those answers are there. Are you seeking God in your daily life and in your marriage, uh, with your kids, in your workplace? Are you seeking the Lord, putting him first in all that you do? Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things shall be added unto you. So putting God first in all that we do, seeking him in everything, in every part of our life, putting God there, looking for him. And then the last thing is the thing that we need to focus on. And he says, then he says, and then uh, turn unto me. He says, uh, he says uh, pray and seek my face and turn from your wicked ways. And from that, I gather the idea that we need to turn and return back to the Lord, return unto him, return to God Almighty himself. You say, well, preacher, I don't need to return to the Lord. I think we all do. <clears throat> I think we need to take a big, long, hard look at ourselves and take an inventory of our lives, uh, the things we say and that we do, the things that we think in our minds, the feelings that we have in our heart. We need to take an inventory of those things and see if there aren't some ways that we need to return unto the Lord. Uh, one of the greatest men in the Bible, even testimony by the scriptures of itself was Job. Job was a righteous man, and he prayed every day for forgiveness of sin, not just for himself, but for his family as well. I think that's what made him a righteous man, is that he realized that he was a sinner, and that he needed that forgiveness, that he needed to return to the Lord. You know, I'm not saying we be so hard on ourselves, okay, but I am saying that we turn unto the Lord, return to him. Uh, one of the, When I think about returning to the Lord, the verse that usually comes to my mind is in the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verse 7. It says, even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances. And it is, it's human nature to go away from the word of God, the laws of God, and to turn from those things that we know are true and right. Not just the Ten Commandments, but all the word, all the ordinances. And so he says, even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances, and as have not kept them, he says. What a sad commentary that is. But it's true in all of our lives. You know, we are not perfect. We are sinners. And we do need to return. And so that's why he says, return unto me. And he says, and I will return unto you. You know, we make any kind of an effort. We lift even just a little pinky to come back to the Lord. He's there. It's like the prodigal son that returns to the father. And the father comes a running. Uh, and God does that. He comes a running. We, we just make just the slightest inclination back to him. He's there to welcome us with open arms. Okay, but he says, I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. And But the sad part of this verse is how he ends. He says, but ye have said, uh, wherein shall we return? The sad thing today is a lot of Christians are in that same boat. We think we're okay. We think that, oh, I'm perfect. I'm Everything I'm doing, everything I'm saying is right and true. I'm smart enough to know that I'm not. Okay, you say, wait a minute, you're the preacher. Yeah, I do. It seems like the more I know God and the more I get to know him, the more I realize how far away from him I truly am. And I think that's what the Apostle Paul was trying to say when he says, I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. He says, not that I have already attained. He says, I don't consider myself to even be close. And it just seems like the more we get to the Lord, know the Lord, the farther away from him we really realize we are. And the more that we need to get to know him, the more that we need to return unto him. And so that's why this cycle of where we humble ourselves and then we pray and then we seek the Lord, look for those answers. And then when he gives us the answers, then we return or turn unto him, turn from our wicked ways. Okay, That's to me what I think of when I think of a house of prayer. 
That's what prayer is all about, okay? Prayer is about keeping our relationship with God where it needs to be. There's a lot of stuff going on in our world that it's different to us right now. We're not used to this, this business of quarantine. We're not used to this business of having to worry about disease and, and that sort of a thing. You know, in, in our lifetime, so many of the childhood diseases have been eradicated. And so this is something kind of foreign to so many people today. Uh, but we will get to a point where we get beyond these things. I, I firmly believe that. I truly do. Okay. You say, why do you believe that, preacher? Because I see way too many good things happening in this world. I still see souls being saved. I see God still doing a great work in this world. You know, even though, uh, you know, like I say, we're quarantined and things are changed right now, I still see God doing a wonderful work in this world. I read prayer letters from our missionaries. I keep getting prayer letters from our missionaries, and I, I, I would like to read them here for, for our people, but I hesitate to do that. You know, just I don't want to put something out there that maybe I shouldn't and stuff. It is kind of the time that we live in. But I get prayer letters from our missionaries all the time. And even though, you know, these are trying times that we live in, I still see churches growing and churches being built and people getting saved and all around the world. How cool is that? And even here in these United States of America, ministries that we support here in the U.S. of A., uh, seeing the great things that God are doing here in the United States of America. And then in churches all across the world, uh, people getting saved and just God doing great things. And so... You know, I, I think we'll see. I, I pray and I hope. And uh, I used to, many years, attended to the uh, Mass on Baptist Temple under the great Dr. Bruce D. Cummins. And uh, one of the things that, that he desired more than anything else was revival. It's something that he talked about, something that he preached about. He used to hold great tent revival meetings there on the grounds and such. And it was a desire upon his heart to see revival. And I, I caught a little bit of that. I'd still like to see revival in my lifetime. You know, revival's not scheduled. <laughs> revival's not, let's have a revival preacher, and it could happen. But revival starts from that, when we humble ourselves and pray and seek the Lord and, and turn from our wicked ways. That's when God starts to do great and mighty and powerful things, and it all starts with prayer. Are you willing to be called a person of prayer? Jesus Christ, again, he says, my house shall be called the house of prayer. That's where we'll end this today. I hope you have a blessed Palm Sunday. I pray that you'll remember the Lord. Again, next Sunday, I'd hope to have Easter services in the church, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen. The ban is not going to be lifted, and so we'll have to do another recorded message. Uh, sad, but that's fine. Uh, we'll still celebrate and worship our risen Savior next Sunday, and, you know, and then we'll go from there and see how things happen, all right? But I pray that you have a blessed day, and again, my house shall be called the house of prayer.